Okay, here we go. Uh, well, thanks everyone again for coming. My name is Michelle Raymond and I am the director of Clark Art Talks and Archer Gallery here at Clark College. Um, I am so excited to host Carrie Orvik here from San Francisco today and have her give her lecture and talk about her fantastic photography and art practice. Um, before we get into that, I wanted to say um, just a few things about Archer Gallery and Clark Art Talks programming. Um, Archer Gallery currently has a stunning show up in our physical gallery space um, in Vancouver, Washington, and it is a beautiful show. It's our first exhibition in person that we've been able to have since the beginning of the pandemic. Yay, um, which is just super cool. Um, the show is titled Of a Setting Sun, and it is a two-person exhibition by Anna Fiddler and Katie Stone. Um, if you're in the area, we are taking appointments to see. It's an appointment only right now. Um, so you can email me if you're interested in checking out the show in person at mraymond uh, at clark.edu, mraymond at clark.edu. Um, and the show will be up through March 11th. So you have a few weeks to kind of um, get in touch with me, set up an appointment and get in there and see this really, really fantastic exhibition. Um, let's see, we also have uh, an in-person closing reception that we're hopefully going to have, uh, COVID willing, and that's going to be on March 11th, so that'll be kind of the last day of the show, and that'll be from 6 to 8 p.m., um, and more details as we kind of go, we're still kind of figuring things out and making sure we can have it, um, but uh, more details will be up on our gallery uh, website, archergallery.space, so keep checking back there for updates, Zoom links, uh, past recordings of art talks, etc., all that's on our RAD website. So go check that out. Um, beyond our Archer Gallery programming, we also have three more beyond today's uh, Clark Art Talks this winter term. Um, in two weeks, we'll host uh, Julie Alpert, uh, a fabulous Seattle and Oklahoma based sculptor and installation artist. Um, and that's on Friday, February 11th. On February 18th, we have incredible figurative painter Keith Jackson, um, and he'll be coming in from Wisconsin. Um, joining us from Wisconsin and a studio there. He is represented by Steven Zevitas Gallery in Boston, which is just one of my favorite galleries in the whole world. So I think that talk is gonna be fantastic. Um, and then finally, Friday, February 25th, we have fabulous realist painter, Terry Powers, um, and he'll be joining us from his studio in Utah. So lots of incredible opportunities to hear from nationally renowned artists coming up over the next few weeks. Um, and remember again that all these talks are recorded so you can just kind of keep checking back on our website archergallery.space for those recordings. Um, and then I'd like to say some thank yous. Thank you, of course, to Carrie for joining us today. Um, thank you to um, ASCC, um, our student government at Clark College for funding and support. Uh, we wouldn't be here without you. Thank you to all the faculty in the art department for supporting us. Thank you, Lisa, for always being here and supporting uh, Clark Art Talks and Archer Gallery. I really appreciate you coming. Um, and thank you, of course, to our students, our students who um, we're doing this all for. You all are here and joining in on this and participating in this, and it's just so great to have you here. All right, and um, with that, I'd like to introduce today's esteemed lecturer, Carrie Orvik. Um, I first met Carrie maybe 11 or 12 years ago now in San Francisco. It doesn't feel that long, but maybe, maybe it was. Um, we were both in graduate programs in the Bay Area at the same time. Um, she was at UC Berkeley while I was at the San Francisco Art Institute. Uh, we showed together at least one time um, that I know of, definitely at Soma Arts for the Murphy Cadigan Award exhibition that we're, we were both a part of. Uh, Carrie's work stood out to me even amongst the best of the best of that year's MFA class. Um, and I've kept in touch with her a bit through social media and kept up with her work over the years. Carrie's work remains as confident and bold as it ever was, known for her insightful and textured work depicting the streets, spaces, and people that make up the beautiful and diverse San Francisco Bay Area. Orvik's work goes beyond pure observation to tell stories of identity and the everyday, presence and absence, both of this time and timeless. An atmosphere that feels open and focused, but also not without a sense of haunting. You can feel loss of people, of a time, of history, of self coming from her photographs, but always with a determined clarity and commitment of movement steadily, even optimistically forward. Orvik has exhibited her work at the Oakland Museum of Art, the Berkeley Museum of Art, SF Camera Work, and the Peterson Museum in Los Angeles, to name a few. She has held residencies at Headland Center for the Arts and Recology SF and operates a tintype studio 
in the Mission District of San Francisco. In addition, Carrie continues her teaching practice across the Bay Area, including at Stanford University, UC Berkeley, San Francisco Art Institute, and City College of San Francisco. Carrie received her BA in Comparative Literature from Stanford University and her MFA in Art Practice from the University of California, Berkeley. Please help me welcome illustri illustrious photographer, Carrie Orbeck. Thanks so much, Michelle. That was, I'm like, um, yeah. I didn't know you were gonna write a little introduction, so I really appreciate it. Of course. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me to be here. So I'm transmitting from a attic in San Francisco, fresh off of COVID. Um, so <coughs> just excuse my um, little coughs and um, they're not really contagious anymore, but <laughs> anyway. Contagious uh, through the screens, huh? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, okay, so let's see, I guess I'll go ahead and share my screen and then get started from there. Um, yeah, so as Michelle mentioned um, in her lovely introduction, um, I have kind of three parts to my practice. So I'm a photo-based artist, mostly working in photography. Um, I have a commercial tintype portrait studio. So um, it's open to the public, kind of whoever shows up. And um, I also do like editorial and commercial um, uh, assignments through the studio. And then I'm also a photo instructor. So most recently at Stanford, but um, mainly at City College and then also the San Francisco Art Institute, which is Michelle's alma mater and also at UC Berkeley. Um, so I guess what I wanted to do was just, <clears throat> uh, since I know there's a lot of students in the, in the room here um, to, you know, I, I feel like I end up working in a lot of different media and sort of around different subject matter. Um, but one of the, you know, if I, if I kind of think about how I might break that down, um, one of the ways is really to always be thinking about myself in relationship to kind of everything else that's happening. Um, and so that can include place and that can include, you know, the environment, you know, physical, um, our physical environment or climate, um, climate change, et cetera, um, to one another. So our relationships with people, our relationships to objects or mater the materials that we use, um, our relationships to ourselves, and that can include, you know, our bodies, our thoughts, our spiritual practice, um, our relationship to a practice, which I think also changes over time, um, our relationship to time in general, um, our culture, uh, our relationship to our history, which is always changing, and, you know, the list goes on, and I kind of leave that one at the bottom, our relationship to hope, which I think can change um, depending on the day. And so when mm -hmm. I think about, you know, um, these relationships, it's kind of like there's endless possibilities for where our inspiration comes from um, in terms of what we want to make work about. And so, and it's always changing. So there's always something to be, you know, kind of pay attention to. Um, and then, the my last little um, kind of breakdown is one of the things when I'm teaching that I I talk about in our in in the class is because I, I try to think about like what is possible to teach in a class. So one of them is always the technical considerations, like what's the technique you're using. So whether that's the format or the materials. And then the creative process itself. So how you kind of work with failure or success, you know, within that, the parameters of the time you give yourself to make work. And then um, lastly is 
the context of our work, which is always shifting and changing. So, you know, the, the image that you might have seen 20 years ago, like, isn't sitting in the same context that it was when you may have first seen that image or made that image. And so that is like this ever evolving kind of um, creation of meaning. And so as I kind of go through some of the different projects that I've done, it's like I'm always going back and forth between these relationships and trying to kind of like approach them from these different technical um, and creative and contextual um, starting points. Um, so given that you know you are in Washington, I just wanted to sort of, um, oh, okay, well, these are just some examples of um, how I work with those different um, aspects. Uh, so I, in my work, I use this historic photographic process called the wet, wet plate collodion process. And that can be on applied to um, metal, it can be applied to glass, it can be applied to plastic and other materials. And so in this case of what's on the screen, I often look at kind of um, a, my in exploring my relationship to place. I think about kind of the place as a whole. And so the image on the left is, um, it's a silver gelatin, like darker in print of a wet plate collodion negative. So it's a glass plate made on an eight by 10 large format camera. And then it's printed onto black and white paper. And then the image um, in the middle is that same corner, but just taken around the corner. This is um, in San Francisco of a, a um, altar for a young man who was shot on that corner. And so I split the negative in half. And so you're seeing this kind of fractured um, uh, approach or strategy to looking at that same corner. Um, I often do a lot of portraiture through my Tintype portrait studio. So that's applying that same chemistry onto metal and making portraits in the studio. And then, you know, if I think about like my relationship to time, I'm often breaking up events and kind of thinking about the sequence of how we experience these moments. So that's um, kind of using that same process on the bottom there with the tightrope project, which I'll talk more about. Um, and then another kind of um, snapshot of ways that I'm still using those same approaches of kind of bifurcating a scene. So the, the image on the left is from the window of my studio, my tintype studio in San Francisco. And the images are about four seconds apart. And so just kind of like what happened that divides those two moments, but also there's this kind of sense of um, a type of union or way that they're connected, um, which to me, you know, can sometimes be a way of um, imagining a more hopeful kind of outlook on, you know, this particular scene that may be, you know, this fractured image in the middle there doesn't isn't able to sort of point to in the same way. <clears throat> um, I like incorporating color into my work. So even though there's a lot that is black and white or kind of monochromatic, um, color is, is an element that I work with a lot, even with these historic processes. Um, and then the last image um, is a collaboration that I did um, which really looks at the context of images and also the relationship of people to their environment. So I'll talk a little more about that, that project. Um, so this is kind of how I spend most of my time. I have to say, I spend so much time in a dark room, whether it's for my portrait studio or for my own work, um, or if I'm teaching dark room um, practices, um, I'm often pouring a plate, um, in my studio or, or out in the field. Um, so this is the, that wet plate collodion process and the liquid is called collodion. So it's kind of forming this base for the emulsion to make it light sensitive so that um, collodion coated plate is then placed into a light sensitive 
um, silver nitrate solution and then exposed in the camera and processed afterwards in the dark room. Um, so this is in my studio. I'm often shooting on a large format camera. This is my smallest large format camera. So I make a lot of portraits kind of using that um, piece of equipment. Um, or this is more likely where I'm hauling, you know, some like large, larger camera around um, and kind of repeating all of those steps over and over. Um, and then this is another kind of makeshift darkroom that I made out at the headlands um, from this little box. Um, so uh, because you guys are in Washington, I just kind of wanted to locate myself. Um, I'm from Alaska, Fairbanks, Alaska, and my family, um, uh, some of my family is from Longview, Washington. And so Seattle was always like the big city that we would go to. Um, you know, to try to be in a more cosmopolitan environment um, from Fairbanks. Um, and I, I put this first just because, you know, as the place that I was from, <clears throat> I've returned to it in different, at different times and um, had different relationships to it. So a lot of Fairbanks has this kind of like industrial flat um, look to it. It, this is um, a gold mine that uh, a friend of mine grew up on, but so it's sort of like it's nature, but it's always got this kind of industrial, um, a lot of Fairbanks has this sort of industrial kind of um, uh, flavor to it, I guess. It's, um, it's not what you think of in terms of like, cascading mountains and fjords and glaciers. It's flat and, um, <clears throat> you know, made up of the tailings from industrial kind of mining and um, uh, different industries, oil up there. And so I hadn't, I, I've spent a lot of time in the Bay Area and I hadn't spent time in Alaska. Um, so I'd gone back after about 15 years of not being there and just trying to understand it through taking kind of large format film um, images of it and <clears throat> kind of trying to explore it in that way and seeing how it could match my memory of that location. And another way that I tried to explore that landscape was through um, physical interventions with it. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit more about where this project came from. Um, but I, I guess I just wanted to use it as an example of a place that um, it's never the same when you return. And so that kind of changing relationship to your past and to your environment is like, it never stays the same. Um, and so depending on what your interests are, you know, that is always a possibility for, for exploration. Um, and one of the things that came up in kind of going back was that I, um, it was my high school reunion. So I ended up bringing all my chemistry um, to my high school reunion and um, taking these portraits of my classmates, who I, many of them I hadn't seen since I was like 18. Um, and so it really was this experience of, you know, putting my head under the focusing cloth and going back in time because they looked so similar to what they looked like at that time, it just we were meeting in a different time. Um, so this was me at my high school reunion um, with my friends had, one of my friends is a civil engineer. So he had lent me some of his um, surveying equipment and someone else lent me a, a generator, you know, um, but it was, uh, it was a project that I just, I knew I wanted to do and then just made it, made it happen. And I think that, you know, for the students in the, you know, who are, are here today, I would just encourage you if you have those kind of half-baked, you're not sure why ideas, I would really encourage you to follow them because you never know what's going to come from them. And also there's usually something deeply personal about why you end up having those thoughts. 
Um, so one other example of that came from my, my family is Norwegian. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't born there, but um, I go back there a lot. And so kind of taking the same process of bringing the camera, photographing the landscape, it's like, I'm always gonna do that. But um, one visit in particular, I um, was sort of navigating these different familial relationships. And what came to me was this image of, of a tightrope because that's what it felt like to be there kind of trying to navigate um, not always like copacetic uh, relationships. And so I, um, this is kind of where my family, um, where my dad was born on a farm in Norway. And um, it turned out that when I went back, my dad's old neighbor, the neighboring farm, had uh, been a tightrope walker when he was younger. And so he had a tightrope set up in his um, yard and said that I could uh, use it. And so the image I had was of stretching a rope from the land in Norway out to a rock um, over the water and walking on it as a way of expressing what it felt like to, to be there. So I found someone in San Francisco to teach me how to walk or, you know, help me, help me learn. And then I returned there um, and my dad's old neighbor helped me set up this rope. It's about a hundred feet. It's a little truncated, this view. And so we set up um, our little boats to try to get the rope across the water. And I ended up doing it. And it didn't change anything um, in terms of, you know, my relationships. There was no concrete shift that happened from this sort of like very single focus idea that I had. But I felt like what it did was I manifested this idea I had into like a physical form for no one other than myself and not even the documentation was really important. It was about what it felt like to do that and the fact that I did it. And so I was lucky to have this, um, it's called a grad graduate fellowship at the Headland Center for the Arts, which is just across the Golden G G Gate Bridge in San Francisco afterwards. <laughs> and I had a year of a studio out there. So I just wanted to see what that would look like to devote my time to that. Um, and so I used, uh, I used video, I used, um, you know, the, the camera for photographs, but I was really using my body a lot and my time. And so kind of like being open to, um, to what happened during that time. And I, you know, kind of committed to being out there. My studio was actually very small. And so that's what sort of made me um, go outside. Um, on, these are kind of like the safety barriers along the coast of Marin. And I had no expectations of what would happen. So I would show up there on those three to four days a week and I would just try things. So a lot of it was physical, um, you know, and video for those of you who are interested in like self portraiture or documenting yourself. Video is a really easy um, way to not have to interrupt those movements. So you can just keep it going and then review what you've done and kind of see what stands out to you, what you wanna revisit. And so that was my practice, um, was really kind of like showing up and seeing what happened. And I felt very fortunate to know what that felt like because you know it's not often that we can, and I paid for it. I mean, I was only working part-time. I was putting things on my you know, gas, food, and bridge tolls on my credit card, which I don't recommend as a financial strategy. But I knew I wouldn't have that time in this place any other time in my life. So I just decided to prioritize it. And so um, you know, a lot of this work is about that effort. Um, and seeing what comes from that 
what came to my thoughts to visually for the work within that effort. And so this is another view of a different um, location. I'm not gonna play that video, sorry. Um, and this is the gym then. So I was outside, but I was able to get this one location at the Headlands, which is the old military gym. And it's this beautiful old building that's actually, the gym is on the second floor and there's a bowling alley on the first floor. And so I um, put those stakes in the ground on the either side of the building and then threaded the rope up through the windows of the gym. And that would be part of the kind of ritual of like setting up the rope, trying different things on it, and then interacting with my camera. And this just kind of gives an idea of the effort um, because I wasn't, I'm not an acrobat. And so that kind of shaking gives you an idea of the type of energy and torsion, you know, that is um, happening on the on the rope. So it's it wasn't about trying to show a fluid, seamless performance, but it really was that daily kind of approach to something that I felt I needed to try and needed to do. Um, so this is, you know, typical day in the gym. Um, and you don't necessarily get a sense of that when you see a still image. Um, you don't know, you know, what that sort of um, struggle is ha <coughs> happening. Um, and so while I was, uh, you know, doing these mostly ridiculous exercises, I would think about, um, things that I had read. So when I was an undergraduate, I was really into Hannah Arendt. And so this is a compiled quote from an essay that she wrote. And essentially what she's talking about is that if the pressure of the future is in front of you and the pressure of the past is behind you, that always at that place that you're standing, you have the, op the option of looking diagonally above or below your situation. And so it's metaphorical for thought or perspective, but I didn't realize that that's what I was actually like physically doing while I was walking on that rope. And to me, that opened up a lot of like possibilities in my mind of, um, of how to show what that experience felt like. And uh, my dad, he was um, much older than me. And so he had actually been in the Norwegian resistance army in World War II. And because of that, with Germany invading and occupying Norway, he, um, he wrote this, this book um, called The Decline of Neutrality, basically saying that neutrality was sort of impossible, um, you know, based on his life experiences. And I think that when I was, um, you know, trying these different images or exercises on the rope, I was thinking that I was kind of somehow balancing two sides, but really it was more about like emerging from yourself with your own voice. And that's actually the strength that kind of kept, kept me on the rope. And so this sort of ridiculous, like Houdini, like character came, muscle man character came out of all of these um, exercises that I was doing. But um, I guess what I wanna stress is just that like to give yourself that time, it really put me in a place of like playfulness with my practice. And so there's a lot of work that can generate from that place when you're not trying to make it be something, you're just like seeing what is in your mind and what you're able to, um, what you're able to do. So because it was in a gym, um, I found these old physical fitness tests, military fitness, physical fitness tests. So I would try these different exercises and I was mostly like really out of shape with them. Um, and so this was, I couldn't do a pull up, but I found this bar would support my weight. So I did these sort of like modified pull ups, but in this place of kind of fun and fantasy of like, let's see what happens. 
Um, so this was one of the final pieces from that series. And then this was my final quote, resting pose, um, even though, you know, there's a lot of torsion on the, on the rope. Um, so it's actually not restful at all. And so this was another image where I was trying to kind of like see how you would show that idea of like levity or, or lightness that I was trying to achieve here, even though in either one, none of that is actually like happening. <laughs> um, and so most recently, an exciting development is that um, this is the Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, which is the highest tower in the West, even though this um, perspective makes this Coit Tower look like it's higher, but it's not. Um, so it's this new kind of building on the San Francisco skyline. And I um, put in a proposal to include my video work of the tightrope up there, especially after these um, last two years of, you know, I mean, everybody had a different experience, but I would just say like, um, I think what came to mind was this idea of sort of trying to find balance in times of uncertainty or loss. Um, and so this just happened this week actually, um, which is exciting. So this is my first test um, of the video on the building, but there's like several things we need to do to, um, to optimize it for this like format. Um, so this is not what the final one will look like, but it's pretty incredible to like, I was never thinking that that's where it was going to end up, but I do think that that kind of the effort and the, the trying of it to be up that high, um, is pretty beautiful to me, not because it's me, but it's because like, that's not what where the project started from, but it's like, those are some examples of, you know, you have no idea what will happen um, from those, you know, ideas that you have that you want to follow. So anyway, I got to kind of darken this and I don't know, get it. There's all these little adjustments, but um, I'm pretty excited about this. So it's going to be uh, up March 1st in San Francisco. Anyway, um, let's see, I can't click on the chat. I, I, I can, I can read it if you want, Carrie. Are you, do you have a oh, question? The technical, okay, let's see. Um, yeah, so, well, just to, uh, regarding the, um, the, uh, how to film yourself, um, hopefully, you know, using video um, gives you some idea because you can, you know, you're just focusing and framing your scene and then um, you can press it and just have things unfold in front of you. And then that is what can give you the idea for if I wanted to, for example, make a large format image of one of the frames in there, then I would know how I would want to set it up. And um, sometimes I would need help for something like that, but I would set it up. I had the idea for what I wanted it. And then I just needed somebody to, um, to help me with like pressing the shutter. Um, let's see, I guess I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit, but just to say that the Recology residency is, I think they have one called Glean in Portland, um, similar yes, with yes. the dump yes. and mm -hmm. probably in Seattle as well. And so it's really like interacting with what people throw away, um, not necessarily in your bin, but what, what people drop off to the dump. And if I may say, it made me completely like, um, jaded about the impact that one person can make around their recycling and compost. And I'm like a big compost recycling proponent, but the sheer scale and volume of what is dumped is just like so beyond uh, us as individuals. 
Um, but I guess I, I would just say that having this residency and this opportunity to kind of do my practice in an environment like the dump, it's a studio at the dump, um, was really looking at my relationship to objects, you know, my things, other people's things, the accumulation of objects and materials on our land, you know, so from an environmental um, point of view, but then also the materials that are available for use in, in your practice. So I, um, I still, you know, interacted with the wet plate collodion process, um, but I tried to um, use chemicals from like household hazardous waste, um, just uh, things that I found to make these different images. And you're also, I was also interacting with people's personal belongings, um, which again, I'm always kind of like thinking about our relationship to, to materials and um, what we're able to let go and, and or hold on to. Um, so this was my makeshift darkroom in my studio. And then I made this 16 by 20 inch um, camera at the dump. And so I, I'm going to play this really quickly because I feel like it'll um, give an idea of what that looked like. So that was the, the camera that I made um, going into the, the facility where people drop stuff off and timing my exposure. Um, and I made that the back just from four frames. So there's two frames there for the film holder and then two frames for the, um, yeah, for the uh, focusing screen. This is my dark room. <clears throat> just from plastic um, tubs and sleds that I found. So this is just black and white paper um, as a negative. I don't negative. know what it is yet, but I'm actually kind of happy with it. And this is the first one, so I'm excited to try some, some of it. I feel like they're like, it's like a whole new landscape that's been created by everything we're discarding. Um, and I think it's actually really beautiful. I feel like, it's not at all what I expected, but it's kind of exactly what I've been experiencing. So in a weird way, it's what I thought I was going to make, even though I would have had no idea that this is what it would look like. So that kind of sums up most of my projects. It's like, I know there's something I want to do. Um, I don't know exactly how I'm going to get there, but it's through the doing of it that then I understand kind of what the thing was that I was trying to make. And so these are, um, it's a paper negative of, you know, these endless mattresses that were at the dump. Um, and then this is a paper positive, the bottom. Um, so that was a contact print of the negative that I made in that, that big camera that I had created. And so, Fast forward a few years, actually just one year, and um, my mom had suddenly passed away. And so I was kind of confronted. I had been looking through all these other people's stuff for that residency, personal belongings, all these mattresses. <clears throat> and suddenly, you know, I had to like put an ad for her mattress on Craigslist. And I realized I was like looking at another image of a mattress and suddenly, you know, the context had completely changed um, of what that image represented to me. And so I made a book, um, there's a, a link to a video on my website, it's called Resting Place if you wanna look at it. Um, but basically that book was kind of thinking about that accumulation of um, material in our landscape from, you know, personal, um, vantage point, but also um, using transparent materials um, 
to show uh, that sort of like receding and disappearing and then ways that um, materials can kind of like compound on each other. Um, let's see, I feel like I'm, I don't want to, I want to leave time for um, questions. So I think what I'll just say is that, you know, I have this commercial tintype portrait studio. Um, it's a way for me to meet so many different people that I wouldn't have known otherwise. Um, some well known, some, you know, just unexpected to meet. Um, it's been a way of working with other artists. Um, so it's, I think that there's so many different ways to think about the work that you make. And for me, this has worked for me to think of it in that way, where some people think of their portraiture practice as part of their like fine art. And I guess it's somewhere in between for me, where it's like, yes, it's the craft, but it really is about the interaction with the people that I'm photographing. And that's kind of the, the crux of it. And so just to close, um, my Tintype Portrait Studio is um, located in San Francisco on the corner of Geneva Avenue and Mission Street. <clears throat> and, you know, that's where I am many days of the week. Um, and so it was very natural to, again, think about my relationship to place, my relationship to people, my relationship to the city that I've been in for over 20 years, and to respond to it, you know, with the <clears throat> with all the materials available to me. So, um, you know, trying different ways of looking, um, so many different formats, just because that seems to be how I work. Um, this is somebody that I met, um, she was a, a prep cook, and then we had talked about doing um, portraits in the studio. This is a a uh, funeral home that's since been torn down. And this is the ladies um, powder room. And, you know, for anybody's own experience of loss and grief, you know what, um, you can only imagine how many, you know, faces have tried to put themselves back together in those mirrors, you know, at this particular moment in that ritual of grieving loved ones. And so just trying to think about, you know, that was not what I was thinking when I took that image, but it just, I think about it, I've had different experiences since then. And I, it means something different to me. Um, yeah, so I think I'll just end. This was a uh, in installation, one of the walls that SF camera work for that body of work. And I feel like I'm not going to do this project justice, but um, why don't we take some questions and then maybe I can talk a little bit about this at the end. Um, yeah. yeah, that sounds great. Thanks, Carrie. Yeah, um, yeah there's been a few um, just like questions about, I think, process and just kind of sure. Um, just talking a bit more maybe about um, technical process. Okay. If you could. Um, should I stop sharing or? Um, actually, it's up to you. Could yeah. somebody just ask me? Because I feel like then I'll have to, um, or can you ask me, Michelle? And then I'll be able to. Ask you the question? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, let's, let's just take, um, we'll take Rachel's question here. I think first it's um, what inspired you to use the old fashioned camera over modern cameras? Oh, well, it's less about the camera and more about just um, being in the dark room. So I learned everything on film in a dark room and then everything shifted at one point to digital. And I felt like I was just going to go nuts um, being in front of my computer, which who knew how much I would be in front of my computer after that. But um, yeah, it was really a way to just stay in the dark room. I had taken a workshop and, you know, there's this seductiveness to all that silver on the plate because it's very um, luminous and, you know, it's a physical object 
and I seem to really gravitate towards those physical processes. Awesome. Um, and then Jamie asks, um, she says, maybe the students uh, would like to know about the technical process you use for photography, photographing yourself. I think you kind of mentioned that a yeah. bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, specific thoughts about how you compose those self-portraits, the way you choose to set up the tripod, remote shutter, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, when I teach portraiture and self-portraiture, I, you know, give some of those technical um, uh, tips, but I think that I would still kind of, and, you know, if I think about breaking down especially in a classroom setting, um, you know, the, there's technique. So those are under that technical aspect, but I feel like the creative process aspect of it is just as important, you know, to um, think about ways that you can feel comfortable, places you feel safe, you know, how, how, how you're able to share that work and talk about it. And so there's been some really beautiful experiences in the classroom, especially the remote classroom of students really supporting each other and, and intentionally creating a supportive space for that um, kind of not knowing, not coming up with a perfect image, but being feeling like safe enough to try something that you don't know how it's gonna turn out. So that's, um, I think, I try to focus on that while offering, you know, um, uh, technical um, suggestions. Yeah, I mean, I think that's totally something that I've experienced too, as a as a teacher in the classroom and the virtual classroom in, in particular. That's been so great about the last couple of years is just kind of this feeling that you know it's okay to play, it's okay to make mistakes and fail in this way that I never really felt comfortable, I think, as an undergrad student. Like I always felt like everything had to be perfect. I always felt like everything had to be exact or I was going to fail. And there was like a perfection or you know failure kind of mentality, like that dichotomy. And I feel like the last two years, especially at least in my classroom, I've very much encouraged my students to play and to spend time failing because you know, it doesn't matter how much control you think you have or how much technique that something can go wrong, you know, and like the pandemic has shown all of us that, that things can go wrong no matter how, how much control and how much time we put into trying to plan everything out, that things can go awry. And so why not embrace that? Why not take this time and kind of spend that time kind of, yeah, just, just getting in and diving in and, and figuring out what we want to make rather than trying to make whatever that thing is perfect, you know? I really love that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, even grad school that's so like critique based, it's you're sort of girding yourself for why you to, to defend or um, give logic to why you did something or made certain choices. And I, I really try to kind of delay that process in the classroom. Yeah, because it's exactly. going to change how you look at it, you know, even six months from now. So absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think there was a question as well about writing proposals for larger projects. Um, students might want to know how to write proposals to have work publicly displayed, um, says Tammy. And I, I kind of agree. I think that's a big topic to kind of go over in a couple minutes. But um, but yeah, if you have any insight into that, that would be awesome. Well, I think I would still return to the creative process part of it. So like that, whether the work, where that work ends up is sort of like secondary, you know? And so to really, I mean, um, the tightrope work, it was so personal to me and I feel like I really devoted myself to it, not um, to, to the practice of it. And so there's no, there's no, like, I'm not making anything up when I talk about it, because I know exactly what I was doing. And I understand it. And I think that sometimes we make work and we want people to like it. And so it's like, if somebody rejects it for some reason, then that's somehow, um, it's as though it has some bearing on what the work is about. And so I think that 
that would be my first thing is to really like have an understanding of why you made something and and to deepen that process of the work that you make so that when you're you know to propose that tightrope work on the building it was more about looking at the building and then having that idea that oh my god that would look amazing so i didn't have to make anything up to write that proposal do you know what i mean it was like it was very clear and they can either accept it or reject it you know they either want it or they don't or they see it or they don't but i think that what can get um iffier is when you propose something to feel like it's being acknowledged or um, kind of validated. And I think that that can put an undue um, kind of like out of your control judgment on it. Um, so that would be the first thing. And then, so if you do have something that you feel kind of like you've worked out, then I would think about the things that you see that you ins that inspire you. Like we saw this uh, body of work in a gallery and it really moved you. And it's like, well, is that a, an appropriate space for this thing that you wanna do? Um, you see a billboard, you know, something like that where it's like, you can connect it to the, like your own experience in addition to things you might not even know about. And so there's like calls for, you know, proposals that are in different kind of aggregate venues on the internet or schools do that. Um, or like the airport or something. I, I was thinking about the airport, like pretty much every airport has a percentage of their budget that, you <laughs> totally. know, they, and, they and purchase I, I art. Just got an email right before this talk for a proposal for that. So I'm like, oh, that's Sweet. so funny. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and they often have really large budgets and they're able to really support sometimes new work. And, you know, sometimes they're able to commission a very specific work in a specific space. Um, and, you know, it can be, you know, in the thousands of dollars, you know, tens of thousands of dollars sometimes. And, um, and it's permanent, you know, it's there for the long haul, which is so cool. Um, I love thinking about that. And that was definitely something I think when I was younger, I didn't realize that big companies like Salesforce or, you know, an airport or um, a mayor's office or something like that, that that might be a place where we could, you know, as artists show our work. Yeah, totally. Um, any other thoughts or? Um, I don't Does anybody know. want to ask questions then, auditorily? Or feel free to jump in the chat and add anything. There were some great comments about um, incorporating yourself, I think, to um, carry into, into your work and um, incorporating like self portraiture, I think, into it. And I really like that as well. Yeah, and I think sometimes, you know, you're the person who's around, so it's sort of by default, um, you know, and some people make the distinction between what a self self portrait is versus, you know, using yourself for the work. But I, I don't actually think it matters because I think it's, it's what comes out in the end. Um, and, you know, I felt like I needed to do that tightrope project. And so I was the, the tool that I was using um, yeah. to kind of explore it. Um, I really held on to like from probably undergrad again, um, reading something that Marisol, the artist Marisol wrote that she said that um, everything the artist makes is always a kind of self-portrait. And so everything that you're making out there, no matter what it is, if it's a landscape, if it's a still life, you know, if it's abstract, if it's, you know, a figure, if it's a self-portrait, it's all going to in some way be autobiographical, right? Because it's all coming from you, which I was just kind of like mind blown, you know, at 18 or 19 years old. It's like, sure. oh, that's right, that's it. Um, so I love that. Um, Megan in the chat says, I like how you mostly use grayscale. Is there a particular reason for that or is it just a preference? Um, well, you know, I think that depending on what I showed today, um, it might be more monochromatic 
work. Um, and that's the chemistry itself. You know, it's a, a black and white chemistry um, of wet plate. Um, but I, I shoot film and digital and I'm interested in color. So um, I think the tintype studio ends up being mostly, uh, you know, monochromatic, but um, I wouldn't characterize the work that I make as just black and white or, or, or color. Um, it's, it's both. Yeah. I think, I think color plays such an interesting role, obviously in every artist's practice, but I think in yours in particular, how interesting it really connects to time. And I think somebody in the chat had said that as well, where, you know, it's like, and I said that kind of at the beginning too, you know, like your work feels of this time and timeless simultaneously. And I really, really feel that way. There's something about it that there's something ghost-like about some of the imagery. And it's not necessarily that it's just the monochromatic work that feels that way. It also feels that way to some degree, I think in your, in your color work. Um, and so, yeah, I guess that's just a comment, but, um, but yeah, I think this kind of idea of connection to time and you kind of talked about that a bit is, is really, um, it really comes through, I think, in your practice. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, just uh, really fantastic, Carrie. Does anybody have any final comments? We have just about two minutes left. Anything anybody, anybody else wants to add? Are there any photographers um, like on the Zoom? Um, my students are all 2D students, but I think Sensney, one of our professors is here. If she's available, she's a, um, our photography, uh, department head. Oh, great. I don't know if she's able to talk right now, but she's in here. I'm totally here. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. I, I don't have, um, anything to say. I love hearing about your work and seeing all the stuff that you do. So yeah, I'm just, it's awesome. Cool. Yeah, I just, um, I think I was just sort of musing about what the photography department, like what was kind of offered there, if there was darkroom facilities or if it was- Yeah, yeah. Facilities. We we are so keeping it real with our darkroom. Um, we had uh, less and less kind of student interest in the darkroom. Um, and we used to have um, separate classes. We had a digital photography class and then a darkroom class. And the enrollment was declining in the dark darkroom class. So we just decided to merge it. And so it's a higher credit load class, but all the intro students now work in the darkroom. They don't get oh, to have so cool. a choice that's about that. Great. Yeah, we have a great darkroom and we just really want to keep it forever. And I think it's such an important part of the photographic process just to have that firsthand experience with the chemicals and that kind yeah, of tactile, exactly. tangible experience. So. So yeah, we're really happy to have a great dark room um, at Clark. And, uh, and that's great. Yes, there. City College in San Francisco has a great dark room, but it's um, you know it's hard to fight for those funds. So that's really great to hear that um, that you're able to incorporate it into your like photo class. Yeah, yeah, it was a decision that we kind of made as a department, but um, it was a great idea and it's and it's working great. I mean, students don't necessarily know they're interested in darkroom, but then when they get to experience it, they're like, wow, this is fantastic. Yeah, and so, it's meditative and kind of therapeutic, I think, as well. Absolutely. Um, and then I just saw there's, a, I'll wrap up, but um, about pinhole cameras and essentially, yeah, the pinhole is just another opening um, for light to come onto the the sensor, whether whatever is back there. So in my case, I had a um, a lens there, but it could have been a pinhole as well. Um, awesome. But yeah, just want to thank you, Michelle, again for um, inviting me. It's nice. Yeah. To of course. Thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. It's been really such a pleasure to hear more about your practice, catch up a bit and have you share, you know, all of your processes and everything with our students and community at Clark College. So thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks uh, to everyone for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, faculty. Thank you, staff. Thank you, uh, students for being here. Um, and um, please join us um, again in two weeks. We'll be back again. Um, 
it'll be a different Zoom link. So check back to our website, archergallery.space for that Zoom link. Um, and it'll be sent out to the Clark College community through email as well um, in another week or week and a half. Um, so check there. And um, yeah, if you get a chance and you're you know, in the area and you wanna stop by the Archer Gallery and check out the exhibition of the Setting Sun, we would love to have you there and um, get in touch with, the, with me through email mraymond at clark.edu. And um, we can set up an appointment to check out the space together, okay? All right, y'all, uh, thanks again. And uh, thank we will see y'all next time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.